two seconds. Yep. Yeah, we are live. Well, let's go. Boa tarde a todos. Hoje é sexta-feira, dia 19 de março, e é meu prazer apresentar para vocês a palestra de hoje do Colóquio do Departamento de Matemática. O nosso convidado essa semana é o professor Samuli. So let's switch to English so that he understands us. Samuli is a colleague from a long time. We've met uh, in several conferences already. He Samuli. works at the Department so of Mathematics so the at the Helsinki University, and he is very successful. He has uh, he leads a research group in applied mathematics, most specifically uh, concerning uh, tomography problems, which is a specific part of uh, inverse problems, and. He is our guest today, and he's going to talk about the magic of math, three-dimensional X-ray vision. Thank you, Samuli. Thanks a lot for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Antonio. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So today I will talk about X-rays and other ways to see through materials and using mathematics to make a three-dimensional reconstructions of the insides of objects. So I have such, such a menu for you today. So let's start with uh, just X-ray images. What are they? So here you can see a traditional Finnish candy uh, inside the X-ray machine. So we can see through the box using X-ray. So this image is with light, with a camera, and this one is with x-rays that go through the box. So we can see that actually we started by eating half of the candy before recording. Uh, here is my little lab at the University of Helsinki. On the left, you see Zenit Purisha. She actually defended already a couple of years ago, uh, did a, a PhD thesis on tomography. And on the right is Alexander Mini, who is uh, now preparing his PhD thesis. And he, uh, his background is in physics, and he actually built this laboratory. Uh, for example, we can put something uh, inside the cabinet, for example, a flower. This one is the X-ray source. And then on the other side, we have the X-ray camera, which is quite a special camera. And then we get an image like this. And the way to think about it is that where there is more material in the middle, the x-rays have a harder time going through so we see white color and then uh, when there's only some little things on the way of the x-ray we see very dark shades and here we see black where there's nothing of course as you know x-rays have been used now for more than a hundred years to see through the human body and for example we can see uh, here a fractured nose uh, using x-rays so of course, this is a very useful technique for doctors. But today, actually, I am looking into a little bit uh, more complicated thing called tomography or slice imaging using x-rays. Uh, and there, the human head looks like this. So this is a different kind of picture than we saw before. This one we have to calculate using mathematics and you see uh, we have this is really like a slice through the human head we can see the eyes and the nose and we can see the brain and the skull bone here uh, in white so it, it reveals the inside of the human head but uh, not in an overlapping way it's like like a slice through and this is the ma magic of mathematics that makes it possible and today uh, one of my goals in this talk is to tell you how this picture is calculated. Okay, so first of all, when an X-ray is going through the head, it measures how much there is material on the way of the X-ray. Here, uh, I'm just writing after calibration, so I'm skipping there a few steps. Of course, uh, practically, the X-ray is getting weaker when it goes inside the head. It gets weaker and weaker. But actually, uh, if we apply a logarithm to the outcome of the X-ray, we can use the X-ray for measuring really like uh, a total of material, how much there is on the way. 
So if you ever wonder where you need a logarithm, this is one place where it is very important. So once we have this calibration done, uh, so that the X-ray measures the total amount of stuff on the way of the X-ray, we can think of moving the X-ray in this way and collecting like a profile of data you see here in yellow. So for example, here, if we go to the maximum value here, there's a lot of bone on the way of the X-ray. So that's why we have such a high value there. Whereas, for example, here, there is not so much attenuating uh, material. So we get such a profile uh, collected. And it's important in tomography that we do this all around. So we go around the person and we measure this profile from every direction of we turn and measure the profile for every direction so this yellow curve or all of these yellow curves here all of them together form the information we have about the the thing we are imaging in this case uh, a person this uh, technology was invented uh, by Godfrey Hounsfield and Alan McLeod Cormack in the 60s uh, and, and early 70s. They got a Nobel Prize uh, for their work. And here is the original machine built by, by Hounsfield. And this is uh, one of the original images calculated by Hounsfield. So it's a, one of the first images, slice images of a human head. There's a old picture like this showing a uh, Hounsfield's machine. Uh, here you can see this linear direction is where the X-ray source is moving, collecting the profile. And then here you see how the machine rotates. So it collects exactly the kind of uh, profiles I showed you before. One interesting detail about Hounsfield's work is that he worked for the EMI company, as you saw in the previous slide, it's the EMI brain scanner. Uh, at the time, EMI was publishing the, the records of the Beatles. And of course, I mean, they were like, making a lot of money <laughs> with the Beatles records. So that's why uh, this uh, music company could afford uh, an inventor <laughs> in the basement building up X-ray machines and trying out <laughs> imaging humans with x-rays. These days, the machines look already a bit different. So this is a modern uh, CT scanner, and they are really fast. So there is some, when we open the machine, there is a part like this. We have a very strong x-ray source here and many cameras here, and this will rotate very fast. And this whole thing can weigh up to two tons. So it's really a, a, a huge machine, a very strong machine uh, for modern CT imaging. OK, now we come to mathematics. This is an inverse problem. So there is something we don't know. The only thing we know about it are these yellow profiles from all directions. Now, once we have measured these yellow profiles, the question is, what is there? <laughs> How can we know what is there? And one goal of my talk is to explain to you what happens here. This is called filtered back projection. It's one of the most classical techniques uh, in, in the field of mathematics called inverse problems, where Antonio and I both work. So this is one of the, the classical methods used, filtered back projection, and we will see soon how this works. Let me mention a curious historical fact uh, also about this method. The formula for filtered back projection was already there in 1917. You see it here uh, in its original form. This is a very old fashioned way to write the formula. It was published in 1917, and maybe you know this, that uh, Hounsfield and Cormac did their inventions in the 60s and 70s. 
So it took like 50 years for this idea to come life-saving practice. And actually, Hounsfield and Cormac did not know about Radon's work at all. So this is the point where I always say to all my uh, mathematical colleagues, let's try to make sure that we, we tell about the great ideas from mathematics to other fields uh, quickly, more quickly than waiting for 50 years so that someone else will reinvent it. Okay, so here are a couple of images uh, showing one application of X-ray tomography. It's about stroke. So sometimes in the brain you can have uh, a problem with blood circulation. So this problem is so-called ischemic stroke. So there is a blood clot uh, preventing blood from going to this part of the brain. This is very dangerous, of course. This part of the brain will die permanently in four hours if it doesn't get uh, blood into it. Also, there's another possibility that there's bleeding in the brain. You see the white uh, blob here. This is blood somewhere where it should not be. The symptoms of these two cases are exactly the same. So the doctors need to know how to treat the patient because for this one, they can give blood thinning medication. But as you see, uh, slice imaging with x-rays shows very clearly that here, this is ischemic stroke, it's dark, and this is hemorrhage because it's, it's bright. And also I mentioned the magical 3D vision. So what you can do also, you can take many of these two-dimensional slice images and stack them up like a deck of cards in a computer and then build such a three-dimensional model uh, to study what is going on inside the patient. Okay, so this was the introduction to X-ray tomography, what it is. And before I'm telling you how to, how to use filtered back projection to compute the image, Let's check uh, your instinctive, your, your natural way of, of being a, a tomographer. Let's see how it works just by understanding the data. So I'm giving you a few uh, problems to consider, and there's always the same thing. There's, there's an object. In this case, there's a white rectangle, and the tomographic data looks like this. So now how to think about this yellow curve uh, here is that when you look at some x-ray, for example, this one, there is zero because there is no material on the way of the x-ray. So there is zero recorded in the yellow curve. Then for this x-ray, you see it goes a little distance inside the white uh, material. So we record here the length of how long is the ray traveling inside the white object. And here you see there's a longer, longer path, so we have a bigger value here. So that is how to understand the data. But now, of course, in the mystery problems, uh, I will only show you this. So you don't know what there is, but I only show you the data, and then you should know what is there. So are you ready? And even if you're not ready, here we go. The first mystery problem is this one. This is the tomographic data. Something like this. Yeah, something like this. Uh, here is uh, something like this. And it is actually one of these. Now, I don't have direct uh, discussion uh, contact to you in this uh, remote talk, but I challenge you to think about this, write it down uh, or write it to the chat. What do you think it is? Here is the data and it is one of these. It's either a disk or pentagon or triangle. Okay, I will reveal the answer. It is a triangle. So this is, this is the situation. So that was uh, our starting problem. So let's go to something more complicated. So now uh, the unknown gives this kind of data. This kind of data, it looks kind of weird. What can we think about this? And let me show you the options. So this time 
is one of these characters, S, B, or W. And now that you know it's one of these three, let me show you again the data. Uh, especially, I will show you the data for the vertical case that is often useful. So take a look at this. Think a little bit, what could it be? And uh, let's see again, this one here. And we get back here. And if you feel sporty and you're sure what is there, please write to the chat, which is the correct answer. And now I will reveal the answer, which is B. Don't worry if you put down something else than B. I've given this test many, many times, and always there are fans of every one of the three characters. Maybe I can reveal that uh, there was a hint. You see, this is like the Batman looking uh, behind a wall. So there was a hint. It's B for Batman. All right. Then the next one. It's again a character. But before you jump to conclusions, let's review the data. So it looks like this. Here is, again, so horizontally it looks like this. And it is one of these. It's like going to the eye doctor. So it's E <laughs> vertically to the right or to the left. And let me give you one more hint with this one. Again, the vertical case will give you some idea, maybe, what it could be, which one of the three it is. And again, if you feel brave, go ahead and write to the chat. And if you're not so brave, just write to your own paper back home. What could this be? And now I will reveal the answer. It is actually the character E to the left, which is the mathematical sign for exists. And why I did show the, the vertical, for the vertical, you can see that if it was the usual character E, then this, this here would actually be on the left side. But now the long uh, way inside the material is now here on the right side. OK, then. We still keep with uh, written information, but these are not any more characters of the alphabet. You can see the data is a bit more complicated, and it's one of these modern written <laughs> informations, not maybe characters, but emojis. So it's one of these, and let me, now that you know it's one of these, let me quick show you again the data. I'm not sure if the vertical helps anything in this case. Maybe it does, I don't know. This is it, and well, do you think you know what it is? If you think, please write it to the chat. I will reveal the answer, and it is the unicorn. Uh, it's really hard to see, in my opinion, even to the direction of the horn. I mean, because of the grayscales of the image, it's not so clear. So it's, it's smaller here than it's in the character itself. So it really is not easy, which is my point in these tests. This is not easy just to see what it is. And then my final example, this is a medical example. Um, we get data like this. So now it's rather complicated again. Uh, it's one of these medical conditions, either ischemic stroke or hemorrhage or a rare but serious condition called the unicornism. I'll quickly show you the data because that's the custom, although in my own opinion, it is impossible to know what it is out of these three. But of course, as you maybe have observed my sense of humor, of course, it is the unicornism. And now it's time for me to state that, of course, tomography cannot be based on understanding 
these data sets by, by human eye. It's very difficult, maybe impossible, and in practice there are no three choices to choose from. We need to calculate the image using mathematics. So we need something that takes in the data, applies it, puts it in some kind of algorithm, and the algorithm will compute for us the image, whatever it is. So there is no guesswork. We don't have to intuitively understand the data. We just need to calculate what is the image. And next, I will show you how that is done. It's called filtered back projection. And my example target for this one is such, we have uh, one bigger disk and one smaller disk. And the data, of course, looks like this. We have now seen many cases of tomographic data. Look how smoothly the image of the small disk travels over the image of the big disk. And of course, uh, our starting point actually is this one. So what do we do? How can we go from the yellow curves into an image of the two disks? Well, it's filtered back projection. So actually, we start with the back projection. The idea of the back projection is taking the data we have and throwing it back to the image domain along the x-rays where it came from. So zero is black, medium uh, size is gray, and big value is white. So we throw this profile back there, and we do it for many directions. And now you see, even with seven directions, we start to see the disks there a bit faintly, but we do see them in some way. And actually, we can use all directions in this way. So now we used all of the directions, and we can see the disks quite clearly. But uh, this is not yet the original target. The, the original target of two disks, it was completely black and white. But here we see many shades of gray. This is not black and white image. So something more needs to be done, and that is the filter. Uh, so this blur, blurry image uh, is transformed using the so-called Fourier transform. Then we boost high frequencies, and we do the inverse Fourier transform. And that's this is actually the content of the theorem by Johann Radon from 1917. He proved that this is possible, and this is how it works. And let me comment a little bit on the Fourier. What is this boosting of high frequencies? I can divide uh, the blurry image. Actually, any image can be divided into frequency content. So, so like in this picture, here is the image. And this is uh, the same image in frequency domain. So this one we can chop up into pieces. So this is the low frequency piece. This is uh, the, the uh, lowish, <laughs> not zero frequency, but lowish, a little bit bigger frequencies, even bigger, and these contain the highest frequencies. And here below, you see in the image domain, you see the corresponding image content. So somehow the low frequencies pick up the big, big uh, features in the image, and when you go to higher and higher frequencies, you get kind of smaller and smaller details divided up into vibrations like this. And here is kind of hard to see. Let me zoom in a little bit so you see there are even smaller high frequencies uh, in this part of the image. And as if you sum up the top row here, uh, they just sum up uh, to the frequency image. Also, these ones sum up to the original image, so to these ones. Uh, because the transform is linear. OK, so boosting of high frequencies means that we are just emphasizing the high frequency information more to get this one and then the inverse. And still give to a little bit more idea, if I just take some photo and I apply the filter to this photo, it will uh, enhance all the boundaries in the photo. So this is what the filtering is doing. So we throw back the information into the image. This is the back projection. 
and then we go boosting high frequencies and we get back the image of the human head so this is how it's done i hope i hope uh, this explanation made sense and you feel that you learned something new hopefully or if you knew this one uh maybe it didn't hurt that way either i hope so then what is there to be done for a mathematician in this field if this thing was done already in the 70s and it's quite a perfect one hundreds of millions of ct scans are done every year in hospitals around the world what is there to be done one thing is that sometimes we want to work with less data so, so to demonstrate this one i i uh, imaged a walnut here you see the walnut inside the x-ray machine and we took this kind of images from 1200 directions and if we use all of those directions and apply filtered back projection we get this very detailed image very much uh, very small details very clear but now if we think that okay we want to save this uh, walnut from too much radiation and we only take 20 images so practically i just picked out 20 images from all of those 1200 we had and i applied the same algorithm and you see that the quality is is not so good anymore because this filtered back projection is not at all designed for such sparsely collected data so what we mathematicians can do is we can try to still make an image even if we have not so much data so here is a comparison filtered back projection and total variation regularization which is one of the modern methods so the data for these two images is completely same so i'm using the same 20 projections to compute these both this just has uh, different assumptions about uh, how the target is and we can have many different ways this is a hard wavelet assumption this is the total variation this is Dobeshi wavelet sparsity this is total generalized variation uh, this is shearlet sparsity uh, and so on so all of these images i'm showing here use exactly the same data but different mathematics to interpret it and different assumptions on what kind of object it is we are imaging so there is plenty of work for us inverse problems mathematicians we develop methods like this and the point is that uh, the point is not that one of these methods would be the best one better than any of the other ones the point is that depending on the application one of these may be better than the others but for another application it may be a different one so let me show you a few examples how to use these techniques and uh, these are related to climate change these projects uh, the first one is uh, we are working with the climate researchers uh, at our uh, at university of helsinki and they uh, are working with models like this that uh, that calculate how the atmosphere is behaving and how the climate is is uh, developing with different uh, scenarios and for these models it's really important to model properly all the things that are happening between plants and air and soil uh, and biosphere clouds there's so much stuff going on and plants are really important because if the plants are modeled modeled badly then the whole model is kind of bad because there are so many plants there are just so so many plants on earth and we would like to understand better how is water and nutrients traveling inside the plant so we have this kind of experiment where there is a young tree uh, in the x-ray device but now the thing is we cannot radiate it too much because the the uh, sapling will die and then it's end of the study so we need to use only little radiation and then wait and make another measurement and then wait and make another one to see how the situation is developing in time so here uh, is one of our, our recent papers actually not in press anymore i think it came out last year this paper so we put some iodine uh, to water that the plant was drinking 
and we could see the iodine because iodine can be seen very clearly in x-ray images so this way we can we can see in time how the the liquid is moving inside the plant uh, without harming the plant too much and this took took some uh, developing of methods because we had so little data and also we had to take into account the time development so and we are still working on this we are we are improving on this but this is our first approach for it then uh, we also did work with an application with nuclear energy uh, i think nuclear energy is an important technique when we are trying to fight the climate change because the nuclear energy has very low carbon emissions and also it can produce constant power uh, as opposed to uh, water uh, and wind and, and solar. And one of the things where inverse problems are needed related to nuclear power is uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, wants to see when the fuel, uh, when the spent fuel is, is uh, put away to storage, they want to check that in the fuel there is what the operator claims there is. Because you know, these are uh, nuclear materials are covered by international treaties and it's important to make sure where they are uh, and keep track where they are going. So the fuel in nuclear reactor is inside this kind of uh, assemblies and inside each of these metal tubes there are these pieces of, of uh, nuclear fuel and here is one example of a used used uh, nuclear fuel assembly which is studied by this new machine called PJET for passive gamma ray emission tomography so there's this waterproof machine, a very heavy machine that can be used inside the water tank and it's donut shaped so the, the fuel can be put inside. And inside the donut there are a couple of cameras that, that are viewing the radiation that comes out of the fuel. So this time we are not having an x-ray source on one side of the target and camera on the other side like we did for x-ray tomography. Now the fuel itself is radiating and we have two passive cam cameras on each side with a very strong collimators so that the, the elements uh, are looking at the narrow peak inside the target. And then the whole thing is rotating like this underwater. Of course, there's, there's a... Uh, lid on this one waterproof lid so there's a rotation movement like this uh underwater and now it's really tricky to to image the thing is that the fuel rods uh they can contain uh, unused fuel which is here the white so it is attenuating radiation very strongly but it's not yet radiating itself there are no gamma rays coming from the white ones this is now a spent fuel rod and there's lots of gamma rays coming out, but it is also attenuating because there is uranium and other heavy elements. So in this case, we get this strange data. You see, we get these peaks whenever the radiation is seen between these rods. We see very high peaks, but then when we go a little bit sideways, there is no direct vision from the, from the radiating part, so it's attenuating so then we have this one so the data looks very strange and also on this side it's very very small because the radiation is traveling through so many attenuating uh, pieces of, of uh, fresh fuel also we may have more radiating fuels and then again the data sometimes they are seen as kind of equal strength but then on, the, on, on this side you see this is very much attenuating but this is very strong because it can be seen directly so this is a non-linear pro problem because everything that is inside it it can attenuate the radiation to some extent or not depending on the material and it can emit radiation or not depending on what it is and now the thing is that if someone has stolen 
some uh, nuclear materials from here, maybe for making bombs or something like that. We need to we need to find out if something is missing. But these empty places are inside this complicated array of both attenuating and radiating things. So how to do this is a nonlinear inverse problem, uh, quite difficult to solve. Actually, we managed to develop quite a nice method with our team, uh, especially Tatiana Bubba did uh, a big work, and also Rasmus Backholm here, and also Camille uh, Belanger Champagne, uh, who is now uh, actually in, in uh, Calgary, University of Calgary. Uh, and here is Tapani from, from uh, Finnish Radiation Safety Authority. So here we are in Vienna collecting our silver medal in the challenge. They had a challenge competition. They actually, at IAEA, they built this kind of little mock-up fuel assembly. So this is not real nuclear fuel, but they actually <laughs> ordered some pieces of cobalt from AliExpress, and they, they used this uh, experimental reactor uh, in Vienna. They put the cobalt pieces, uh, cobalt-59 uh, pieces inside the nuclear uh, reactor, and then in the neutron flux, they became uh, cobalt-60, which is highly radioactive. So they activated the cobalt pieces for different times inside here and put them into these assemblies so they could build these, these kind of uh, uh, similar things than, than used uh, fuel assemblies. So then, filtered back protection can be used, but the thing is that it only sees where there is radiation coming out, uh, and it cannot feel that back projection as a linear method, it cannot understand uh, both attenuation and activity. So then uh, with feel that back projection, if we try to see all of these missing, uh, missing rods, there will be many errors, like this one uh, is actually missing, but uh, it's, not, it's not seen here. These are missing but there are many errors here. So what we did actually, we built a, a non-linear inversion method that can understand the data uh, much better and also give both where it is radiating and where there is attenuating material. So two images. How we did it is we actually used this kind of triangle regularization. So we thought that, okay, there can be light material that is not radiating and there can be heavy material that is not radiating. This is fresh fuel. And there can be heavy material that is also radiating a lot, which would be spent fuel. But there cannot be anything here. This would be like light material that is radiating very much. So we excluded this area. And that already helped our method very much. So actually, for many cases like this one here, we got a perfect classification using our nonlinear method. Okay, and then in the end of my talk, I would like to bring up uh, a, a viewpoint here that why this is really mathematics at its core, this work I'm describing. Because you, know, you, you saw a lot of physics, there was a lot of x-rays and gamma rays, lots of physics going on, but mathematics really is the core of tomography because there are many physics principles going on, but the mathematics is always the same. That's the core thing. So, for example, here is uh, adaptive optics. Maybe you know, uh, for example, in Chile, there are uh, telescopes uh, looking uh, to space, but the atmosphere is constantly in movement uh, and there is turbulence in the atmosphere, so the images are blurred. But there can be mirrors that can be moved or shaped differently a thousand times a second. So the, the mirror is actually <laughs> reacting to what the atmosphere is doing and correcting the image in real time. And for this, there's a tomographic problem to be solved. And here you see how much it makes a difference for an Earth-based uh, telescope. On the left, you see what the atmosphere is doing to to the image, and on the right you see how the mirror is able to correct the image if, if 
a tomographic problem is solved uh, a thousand times a second. Another example on a big, big scale is uh, this monitoring of the ozone layer. There was uh, the, the so-called Envisat satellite going around the Earth. Uh, and let me show you how it measured. So the satellite picked up one star and then when it moved, it looked at the star and measured the light with many colors, how, how bright it is. So now when atmosphere comes into the play, so there will be attenuation of the light uh, at different amounts because the light is traveling through the atmosphere. And the amount of ozone is, is uh, crucial on how this ray is changing. And then when the star is sitting behind the horizon, then the satellite grabs a new star and again it looks how much there is attenuation. Then it goes around and we can solve a tomographic problem. This is so-called exterior tomography because the rays cannot go through the earth and we can uh, calculate where there is ozone. So th there is not so much ozone on top of the uh, Antarctic and, and there is more ozone here. So this was from the Finnish Meteorological Institute. Okay, then the next physics uh, thing is neutrons. Uh, neutrons are funny uh, compared to X-rays. I mean, this is an old film camera. And if you take an X-ray image, you see that metal parts are attenuating very much, like this part here uh, and many parts here in the lens. But plastic is transparent. The rays are just going through the plastic just like that. However, the same camera measured with neutrons, you see that the metal part here is transparent, uh, but the plastic parts are very much stopping the neutrons because that's how neutrons are. They, they, are, they are scattered by hydrogen, but metal is transparent. So it's, it's complementary imaging compared to uh, X-rays. Uh, this is a nice image, thanks to Anders Kestner, he sent it to me from Switzerland. So here we can see how to make coffee. So you can see inside the aluminum pot, coffee is made. And here, the thing is that plastic and water contain hydrogen, so they are scattering the neutrons very much, but metal is transparent. So we can nicely observe how an espresso pan is working because we can see through metal very easily. And this can be used, for example, in the study of fossils. So here is a very old seed cone from New Zealand. And the, these scientists uh, took this fossil, uh, and it's a very big one. So with x-rays, it's hard to go through uh, so much stone. But neutrons make it very easy to image it from different directions. So they, they could uh, see a lot of structures in the seed cones uh, to know what plant it is and, and whatever these biologists or paleontologists want, want to see. So neutrons are much better than x-rays uh, in this case. And then my final example is electrons, imaging with electrons. Uh, as you know, uh, from quantum physics, electrons behave uh, like waves or they behave like particles but also like waves that is the nature of quantum particles and because the wavelength of electrons is much shorter than the wavelength of light we can see small things with electrons so here there are coronaviruses we can see with electron microscopy and actually uh, with cryo electron microscopy we can freeze deep freeze samples and image them from many directions. And here, I think this is quite amazing how cryo-electron tomography shows how the, the coronavirus is replicating itself inside the cell or how it's making the cell produce new coronaviruses. So it can be even so small things can be seen happening using the cryo uh, electron tomography. It's a very recent paper. I was quite amazed to see what can be done with uh, electron cryotomography. And here's another example. This is uh, internal anatomy of, of a bacterium. So this is a swimming motor or swimming 
swimming engine of a bacteria. So this is rotating and rotating some kind of swimming uh, uh, part of the bacteria. So we can see that actually the swimming engine has all the similar uh, parts than human-made electric motor has. Although, of course, this was uh, built by evolution much before there were humans. But uh, with, uh, with tomography, we can see both things big and small, which is quite amazing to me. And I think somehow what to think of all this is that tomography or slice imaging is a wonderful way to see inside things, big things and small things alike, if you pick the right physics. But the mathematics is the same always. It's the mathematics of inverse problems. Thank you very much for following. This is actually all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Samuli, for the very nice talk. So, um, I see many of the students in the audience, including myself, <laughs> try to guess <laughs> your, okay. your games you played before. How did so, it go? <laughs> well, uh, I missed half the ones I tried, so I missed the letter double V. Yeah. Anyway. They are hard. They are they are surprisingly hard. The unicorn, the unicorn thing was really impossible, I must say. <laughs> I know. I know. It gets crazy when there are gray levels. I mean, with the purely black and white, maybe there is some chance, although it's not easy. But with the gray levels, it becomes really impossible. <laughs> yeah, indeed. No, but I also learned a very important thing that the the sense of humor of the Finnish are very similar. I have many similarities with the British and the Germans. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I see. So, since you are an expert, uh, a serious question now before the students uh, say something, uh, have the opportunity to say something, you know, there is a delay between our transmission and the audience in YouTube. Um, you are an expert in, in tomography, and, and actually, I forgot to say, uh, Samuli has a, a experimental laboratory in Helsinki, and they build these up devices. And we just wrote a paper last year, and we used some experimental data produced by by your lab. So nice, yes, nice. Uh, nice. And he 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 knows a lot about the state of the art of the research in, in tomography problems. So. What would you say is by now the uh, the new uh, frontier of research in the direction of tomography? You know, it's reducing costs of existing tomography types or uh, inventing new tomography types. I think one important one is to follow fast movements and fast changes in, in targets because um, that's something that, that makes it is, is difficult because then you, you, you don't have time to measure from all around. Because then if you can measure from all around, uh, that's kind of well known and we can make good images. But if the thing is moving or changing very quickly, that is uh, interesting. And in medical imaging, I think one, uh, one important problem is metal artifacts especially for uh, dental imaging and head, head imaging, because in, in teeth, uh, people often have some metal uh, parts, and that brings some nonlinearity to the measurements, because metal is so much attenuating, and also it makes the x-rays, x-rays of different colors, because we, when, with x-ray tube, it's not purely like x-ray laser, but it has many x-ray colors, so the metal messes it up. It, it, <laughs> attenuates them in, in, a, in a difficult way. So there are things to do, how to reduce. And now, for example, deep learning and these machine learning methods are much uh, developed for this, for example. Oh, this is quite nice. You mean uh, for constructing the picture or for uh, diagnosing the picture? Both. I was more talking about the the just reconstructing the picture, but yes, you're right. There's also a lot of research about automatic diagnosis with with machine learning, and sometimes uh, it can. It, uh, also, I, I'm working with some uh, 
hospital physicists, we have some, uh, and doctors, we have some projects where we try to combine both so that uh, the, the machine learning would be there to both reconstruct and to understand the content. So I think it's, it's a kind of a currently going on such research. Yeah, you mentioned tomography, uh, tomographic problems with partial data. I remember seeing a very old paper from Gabo Herman where he attacked this problem of doing a tomography mm -hmm. from the heart using only partial data because the heart uh, beats fast and you don't have time to do measurements all around. So it was a very yes. important structure of this problem. So until this day, this is a it's important field of research. Yes, I think so. For the heart, uh, there's a, there are good solutions now using so-called gating, where uh, during the tomographic imaging, there's also a measurement when the heart is beating. So then they measure over many heartbeats. And then, of course, the images are from whatever directions compared to the heartbeat. But then when they are synchronized, and if we assume that every heartbeat is... Uh, uh, similar, so it happens uh, the same way every time, which is roughly, uh, approximately okay. So that works, but then on the other hand, sometimes uh, the doctors want to put some contrast agent to the bloodstream, which is called yes, angiography. Yes. And this happens only once. The, the, the iodine will go to the veins and, and then it will disappear. So you cannot do that with over many heartbeats. So there are always some problems where the data <laughs> collection is, is difficult and you, you have limited data problems. You have limited data, yes, I remember. Yes. Yeah. Yes. People starting uh, started this uh, tomography thing in the 70s, I think, doing uh, yes. research and constructing devices and so on. Yes. Uh, no, that's nice. And uh, what about other kinds of tomography nowadays, especially here in Brazil, the MRI tomographies are very popular. So mm -hmm. uh, what is the difference? Uh, well, not uh, concerning the mathematical model, but uh, concerning the, the quality of the reconstruction uh, when you compare MRI to X-ray tomography. Well, they, they, they complement each other very much because for x-rays, for example, bones are very clear because there is calcium that is very much attenuating x-rays. But for soft tissue, uh, especially for the brain, it's difficult because it's inside the skull, which is attenuating. And then the soft tissue is very delicate uh, contrast for x-rays. So it's harder, but for, for uh, magnetic uh, MRI imaging, there, um, because it measures a completely different physical thing. It measures the, the uh, hydrogen <laughs> content and, and the different, different things in, um, in the anatomy. So they can see soft tissues much better, but MRI is not so good for bones. So I think it depends a little bit what you want to see, uh, see. and which one to use. And also the magnetic uh, imaging uh, has no health hazards. <laughs> this is true. But the, the x-rays, they, they give you radiation dose. So that's also one thing to consider. Uh, with the x-rays, there has to be some limit how much you can give in one year to one patient. Yes, yes, this is true. This is true. Oh, it's quite interesting. Uh, Samuli, I think our students are quite shy today because uh, I haven't seen any, any, um, <laughs> any questions whatsoever. So, if you allow me, I would like to, to share with our students <laughs> some more information about you and your projects. So just this week, I researched about uh, what Samuli was doing, and I learned that he is very active in uh, this projects of uh, popularization of mathematics. So I realized that he has three different uh, YouTube <laughs> channels, all of them talking about mathematics and some about inverse problems and this one i think is finnish it's a finnish one so yes. um, but for example the tomography well yeah there are some and many of these uh, on this channel many of the videos have english subtitles so oh that's nice yeah. and this one here uh, i got some advertisement about this channel some months ago 
and I went to see what was going on, and I saw uh, the same game you play today with the tomography. You play here also with the waves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <the indeed>. <laughs> yeah. So it's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I think it's nice. Uh, we had last year here um, also uh, a speaker, uh, and she was a very famous uh, Brazilian YouTuber. Mm -hmm. uh, who nice. uses to, to use mathematics uh, as a ground for her channel. So, and I think it's very important to use science in order to, to make people have fun with science. Science is not only uh, indeed, yeah, yeah. Science is not only a hard thing that we should uh, consider as uh, some sort of esoteric thing, but uh, it's something that should play some role in our lives. So that uh, yes, we know what's yeah. going on when we enter a, tomo a tomograph or. A device or whatever. So yeah, this, yeah. Science somebody, is very cool and fun. <laughs> in, in fun, exactly, exactly. So uh, I suggest you guys take a look at his channels, um, and you have a very nice idea, a very good idea of what's going on, uh, uh, what kind of problems uh, science is able to to solve and attack uh, with success. So. Uh, Somebody, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and for delivering this very nice talk. Uh, do you have some final words to our audience, to our students? Well, I would welcome all of you to the wonderful world of inverse problems mathematics. I'm sure Antonio is a great guide there, and um, I hope you enjoy <laughs> inverse mathematics in your life. <laughs> yes, inverse problems are... Um, everywhere and we are not aware of that fact no? yes indeed <laughs> inverse problems are used to solve many many different problems in our daily lives and we are really we, maybe we heard about tomography or other kind of stuff but uh it's really much more uh, used than people guess yes so, really, thank you very much uh for for your, this very nice talk and for accepting our invitation and i hope to see you soon when this uh crazy pandemic events uh, are over. For sure. Thank you for having me. And definitely let's meet up uh, immediately when, when this uh, pandemic allows. So thank you very much. Have a thank nice you. weekend and let's keep in touch. Yes, indeed. Bye-bye. <laughs> <Bye -bye. laughs> Muito bem, assim eu me despeço. Uh, boa tarde a todos e nos vemos na próxima sexta-feira para a próxima palestra do Colóquio. Uma boa tarde a todos, bom final de semana. Muito obrigado pela atenção. Um grande abraço.